10. So, say it again. Um, is it from looking at all the iterations? Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So, um, so the question was in problem number five in this homework, which is refers to problem number ten in chapter four, part B. It says estimate the maximum number of new cases in any one week. Uh, so the new cases uh, infected, right? So it's basically looking at the infected population over the span of that week. Um, hold on, in any one week. So that would be like looking at all the different iterations of the weeks. But there's like seven times. Right, because this is a weekly thing, right? It's an updated weekly, is it? Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So it would be the maximum of, of all the iterations. I mean, all the values in... Right. Oh, of new cases. So, right. So, so the difference. The delta, delta I, whatever. The delta for each week. Right. Well, I mean, at each at each iteration, you know, how, you can count how many new cases there are. You know, is the number of infected? Um, let's see. I don't. I don't remember the exact. So I is the number of infected. Uh, C is the number of immune. Right. Yeah. By the way, that, was, that model is kind of a, again, a fam not, not a famous, but I mean, it's a, kind of the original models um, for this kind of infectious disease population. So, um, <clears throat> right, so how do you account for the new cases? Count the number of infected that week? Subtract the number of infected the previous week. And if you save, if you save the previous week's information before you uh, override it, then you'll have it. Uh, you'll have a delta on a per-week basis. I'll say that the delta, the positive term on your delta i should be the number of cases that you use. A s times i. Yeah. That's the rate. Okay. Because then it subtracted the um, uh, the number of of immune cases that the change in the number of immune um, immunized people. So so I guess it makes sense to um, to look to look at that rate a times s times i, right? So S times I, the product of S times I. All right. Let's see. Any other questions? Yeah, it doesn't help that I actually skipped assigning this problem uh, back in Chapter 4. I should have assigned the problem in Chapter 4, so... Um, then it would have been much easier, I guess. But um, all right. So let me um, <clears throat> say one thing. So, we're, so there isn't really anything new in uh, Chapter Six that um, that we need to cover for you to work on the other pro four problems, I believe. Um, one. Um, one of them involves, so let's see, it's 20, 21, 25, and 26. So, um, 
Number 21 actually is ask for an implementing of the Runge Kata method. And um, notice that there isn't much. Well, so this is just an exercise um, in modifying that code for the, you know, instead of one line, you, you got to put four or five lines. But um, also, what I'd like to point is you remember how in Euler's method, we look at the um, kind of how things change if the step size h changes, right? If it gets smaller or if it gets larger, right? So one way it's kind of you're approximating the true the true dynamics of a continuous system. If you make h smaller, if you make h larger, of course you're going away from the continuous system, and in turn you get this chaotic, sometimes this chaotic behavior, right? Period doubling and all this. Uh, so. I guess it's a it's the same question that would would um, would should or could be posed for the other methods like Runge Kata method, right? So if H is um, instead of making made smaller and smaller to, to get a better approximation for the uh, continuous dynamical system, what happens as you make H uh, larger? I don't know if there is any particular question for you to um, to do that, but. Um, if you're curious, I think you could take any of the any of the other problems, and instead of implementing Euler's method, implement the Runge Kata, and increase the H um, value. And of course, you're going to see different things than you see in the in the uh, when you when you use Euler's method, but um, you will still see chaotic behavior, no matter what. Um, so. So, try, try, I mean, again, you can try them uh, even now, and let me know by Wednesday if there are any um, issues with those problems, okay? Um, also, so on Wednesday, I'd like to, or even today, I, I think, if um, time permits, I'd like to start talking about Chapter 7. Um, which... Um, <coughs> Which takes us in the realm of probability models. Um, so, and basically stay with it sort of to the rest of the semester, except uh, possibly move to, um, I mean, certainly move, talk about Markov chains, which is a type of discrete dynamical system that has probability kind of. Um, well, it's a probabilistic model. But, uh, um, so, so the nature of Chapter 7 is that um, it's just sort of a review or sort of a rephrasing of, of things that you should have seen in other courses um, and how they kind of fit with what, what we've been talking about. <clears throat> so before we start with Chapter 7, um, I still like to talk about some of this chaotic behavior um, that is seen. We've, we've, we've seen certainly we've seen it in, in discrete dynamical systems, um, and also I mentioned in continuous dynamical systems there are you know very relatively simple um, you know uh, physical systems where this kind of um, sens uh, sensitive dependence on initial condition is is observed. Um, with this, I want to emphasize the fact that we don't have, in all these models, there's nothing probabilistic. So there isn't, I mean, these models sort of ignore uh, everything, anything that's random, okay? So um, even in this Lorentz model for you know, let's say pro, uh, weather weather prediction or weather um, so it's it's basically a three three variables that are being observed. Um, 
in, in so let's say, the portion of the atmosphere. And um, these variables represent, let's say, one of them says so represents the rate at which convection rolls rotate. X, Y represents the temperature difference between ascending and descending air currents, and Z represents deviation from linearity of the vertical temperature profile. So, um, so again, it's not it's not exactly what I was um, saying last time that you talk about pressure, temperature, and humidity. Okay, um, but the striking feature of this of this model is that in how how easy it is to write it down, and it basically I'm going to use x, y, and z since. Um, I think last time we saw it like that. So, so it is. Uh, it consists of terms that are simply um, either linear or quadratic, right? So it's like predator, prey type terms, right? And. There's absolutely nothing, nothing. So this is a deterministic model. Right? So no random uh, effects are observed. Or, you know, even if they are in the model, I mean, they are ignored. Um, and we're just simply saying that at time zero, the x of 0, y of 0, z of 0 are known or are given and then this, this dynamical system is deterministically um, projecting what the variables x, y, and z will do, right? Still, what, what I said last time is that it's, it's done deterministically but it is um, very sensitive to the values of this thing. So, for practical purposes, even if these are, I mean, this cannot be known as exact values, right? So, so there is some. You wouldn't call that random, or, or it's not. You know, this model is not supposed to uh, to take into account any random fluctuations of that initial condition. Okay, it's just simply to um, solve these differential equations and tell you the behavior of the system. And uh, let's see, so last time we had this. Ah, and it's not P plane, of course, right? I think it should be the same system. Uh, well, some of the parameters are renamed, right? Like, the, like this is instead of a it should be sigma, instead of b should be r, instead of r should be b. So these these are kind of flipped around. Okay, so maybe maybe I'll change them just so we can. A is sigma, looks like sigma, so I'm going to leave it like that. Okay, so and we remember that's sort of this dynamics, okay? So, what do you do with every system, uh, well, with every dynamical system? What have we been doing with every dynamical system like this? The first thing you do, you do a steady-state analysis and, of course, you, you study the, the, the stability of the equilibria, right? So, so this is simply a system of algebraic equations. Okay, many of them, I mean, some of them are even linear, excuse me, zero. Which you can actually do it explicitly by hand. Okay, although it's, you know, you run into that risk that it's, um, it's, it's not going to give you anything. Um, but it's actually written down in the book. 
uh, of the steps there are. So, so there are actually three equilibria. Yeah. Um, on your second equation, they wrote uh, Rx is positive. Thank you. Is this what I have here too? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. So again, this should not be an exercise in solving a system by hand because you know it's a nonlinear system. So, but you can you can see. I mean, x and y seems to be. Uh, well, and also I have a plus here, right? Okay. Um, so, in fact, x looks like it has to be the same as y. Uh, and then you have these two equations which you can solve for uh, x, y, and z. So, the first, the, the one equilibrium is obvious is 0, 0, 0. And there are these two other equilibria which I think um, differ just by. Well, slightly. So this is b r minus square root of b r minus one square root of b r minus one. So that's x equals y, and that's z, right? And there is a minus, which would just then have a minus here. Okay. So in the x y z in the excuse me x y z in the space, you have this. This is one equilibrium. And then there is there are two other equilibria. One it's uh, let's see, one it should be kind of in the first octant. Let's see, R I believe it's chosen to be. Twenty eight, so that's that is certainly positive, right? Well, oh, excuse me, greater than one. Okay, so it would be something like like this and then sort of the symmetric with respect to the Z axis or not, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it kind of it's if this is the projection of the xy plane, then these two things are kind of mirror images. Okay, with respect to the z-axis. Okay, so you have three equilibria. Now there's no p-plane, there's no phase phase plane here, right? It's phase space, and then it's it's difficult to to say anything about uh, the solutions. So what you do is you, you, um, you the next thing to do is to study stability, right? So the stability, I mean, simply uh, amounts to to do what? Linearizing around each equilibrium and. Um, So remember, for continuous time dynamical system, that amounts to computing the Jacobian matrix, right? In this case, is minus sigma, sigma 0, r minus z, minus, why is it minus 1 there? Oh yeah, because it's minus x, minus y, okay? And then it's minus x. Uh, what's the last one? Y, X, and minus B. Okay? So this is just taking partial derivatives. Okay, so it's a 3 by 3 matrix. And, you know, you can certainly do this symbolically, right? Or whichever way you want, uh, if, you, if it gets too complicated. Uh, for, for X, Y, and Z equals 0, this is relatively easy, right? But for the others, it's going to be kind of hairy to find the eigenvalues, right? But you need the eigenvalues of this. So um, at 0, 0, 0, let's see, the matrix A has uh, three eigenvalues, which are lambda 1, Lambda 2, that's minus 11 minus square root of. Oh, by the way, this these values uh, up here, the, the reason for these numbers is because uh, of the choice of sigma, r, and b. Okay, so I'm not actually writing 
um, well, I guess I guess we should we should try to see what the eigenvalues look in terms of sigma r and b. But if you don't have any any kind of choice of sigma, uh, let's see. I'm sorry. So I think this is this is this is kind of a sensitivity with respect to one of them, the r, right? So for the sigma and b, there there are uh, values that are being kind of fixed, right? So the point is that you want you want to kind of choose one of the uh, parameters and make a discussion based on the, the possible values for that parameter. So you have to you have to choose the other ones, right? Otherwise, it would be kind of difficult to to make any um, you know conclusions. If you had sigma and b and r in, in this in this in this uh, eigenvalues, um, okay. So, so what do we look when we uh, compute the eigenvalues for this Jacobian matrix? We look whether they are positive or a real part uh, is positive or negative, right? So let's see. I think. Uh, well, certainly this, if R is a positive number, this is real, right? Uh, and this this is negative, obviously this is negative, but the problem with lambda 2 um, could be positive, right? So if R is large enough, right? In fact, R equals 1 looks like makes this lambda 2 0. So, so the real part of lambda 2 well, there's not even a real part because this uh, this are real. So if R is positive or greater than one, let me just say greater than one, then lambda two is is positive. So this means that E zero is unstable. Okay. Well. This conclusion is actually tells you very little about the whole system, right? It just says that if I start somewhere close to the, to the origin with my initial conditions, I'm I'm not gonna approach that uh, the zero solution, right? So we can start with something very close, even well, I don't know. I'm just I'm just uh, picking some values, but you can see that. It, it it would be very hard to actually find initial conditions for which everything goes to zero, right? On the contrary, almost everything you, you put for initial conditions will actually looks like eventually it's going to do the same thing that you saw earlier in some some form or another, right? So, uh, and as I said last time, that there is the um, better way of seeing this, right? Uh, in which, I mean, simply viewing the, uh, what is this? <coughs> simply viewing the, the, the trace of the solution, not necessarily the temporal dependence of the, of the components, but just the trace of the solution, shows that every, it looks like every, every initial condition, well, that uh, one can try would actually eventually um, have this behavior. Now, um, this is for this particular values for the for the parameters, right? But if you change the parameter, so if R is uh, let's try one. I don't know what one will do, but okay. You see, you see the uh, the change. It's a dr it's a drastic change in the parameter, right? That's for sure, but that kind of suppresses everything that was. Um, and does it look like it goes to zero? Maybe not. But if I choose anything R that's like below one, zero point five, then this clearly should it shows that it actually approaches the origin, right? Again, this. This uh, and, and I'm choosing values that are very close to zero. But if I choose the original values that are far away from zero, 
for that change of the parameter, I forgot which value, which initial condition was here. I don't know. You still see what that that the solution goes to zero. So, so yes, we knew that for r less than one, all those three eigenvalues are negative. So this is asymptotically stable, but that information alone doesn't tell you what happens with solutions that are, uh, start far away from it, right? So there is uh, there is a lot, you know, a lot more that needs to be studied, you know, to draw those conclusions. And again, here we're just kind of, um, you know, experimented. I, I, I'd say, right? You see, even here, I, I went really far away. I'm still getting to, to that. So it has to do with the dynamical system in three or more dimensions, which is a very peculiar feature. I mean, very, very complex, can be very complex. Okay, but so the surprise was that there is a range of parameters that causes this kind of behavior to exist, okay? Um, Okay, so again, the study, uh, what do you think the other two equilibria uh, might do just from this picture? Would they be stable? You, you kind of see the other two equilibria are somewhere like where these two lobes are, right? And of course the origin, I don't know why I rotate it, but it, it's, it's somewhere here, right? So this certainly is, is unstable. And what do, you, what do you think is happening with these two? It'll also be unstable, right? But again, that alone doesn't even doesn't explain this. So this this steady state and stability of the steady state is kind of the, an epsilon step towards understanding the uh, this kind of long time behavior. Okay. I have a question. Please. If you start your initial conditions inside that limit cycle, can we assume it'll look like the RLC since those are unstable. There is, there is no limit. That's a good point. Uh, we would have to kind of compute those eigenvalues. Excuse me. We have to compute those uh, steady states and start close to those to see. But you see, this is not a limit cycle like in the RLC of Van der Paul. So in other words, you cannot expect the solution to just kind of circle around this thing. It will still do the the whole while you know the butterfly effect. So so even if you start here, in fact, I'm pretty sure that if you start anywhere in a you know reasonable box, um, you know in 3D, you will always go towards this, right? So this is like an object that every is attracts everything, right? But this is not a closed, like, like there's no uh, solution that is start somewhere, does a million things of this, and then goes back to the same place, right? So you could zoom in. I don't, uh, it's not a best way to do it, but you could zoom in. Um, it's like the Saturn, uh, you know, ring. I mean, you can, the closer and closer you go, the more, uh, the more things you start seeing interesting, right? Is that... You, you actually visit the same uh, region infinitely often, right? If you long infinitely amount of time. But, um, but yeah. And uh, so if you start inside of that region, um, you will not only circle this lobe. You'll, you'll do the same, the same dance around both lobes. Um, now there are two two other things that I want to. I mean, there there are, there are since the discovery of this. And by the way, Lawrence made this discovery what in the 60s. Um, there is a fairly recent lecture that is videotaped, and I wanted to find it, but I couldn't. Uh, I'll, I'll put the link here, in which you can actually see him talk about this these things. But uh, last time I saw, he actually died in 2008. So just you know, a, year, a little bit more than a year ago. Um, but since then, there's been a huge amount of, of um, um, examples of this kind of behavior for in continuous time dynamical system. So one is this called Rossler attractor. So I put a link here to 
a Scholarpedia article. And rem remember, Scholarpedia again uh, is kind of uh, this, these are actually peer-reviewed articles, and the authors are some. Most of them are the the ones that actually originated. So, so uh, this is actually written by uh, Otto Rossler. Um, and look at the system. Isn't that amazing? It actually looks simpler than the Lorentz attractor. I mean, Lorentz Lorentz Lawrence model. Um, it is still nonlinear. It has z times x, but actually the nonlinearity only occurs in one of the equations. Previously, it was occurring in, in two of the three equations. All right, and this is what how the the attractor looks like. And again, for certain values, the parameter. Right. So I don't know if you can see that. Um, oh, okay. So the values of the parameters are are written down here. Okay, so you can kind of look through this if you want. Again, it has, looks like it has only two fixed points, right? Um, and what else? I think both of them, uh, you know, are, uh, are unst unstable, right? And this is kind of the, um, the geometry of that. It's in 3D, right? So it's not, it's something you can actually you know, build or put your hand on. Um, okay, so you can try this with OD solve. You can try this um, if you're if you're curious, but but you will see you'll get this picture. Okay. Uh, let's see. So what do I want to say about this? So okay, I don't want to say much because it's it's very similar in in a way. Um, And it's actually even simpler uh, to study. Um, but the, what I want to point is, is there is actually a very kind of natural system that one um, um, uh, that, that that one can you know play with, um, and that's double pendulum. So I put a link to actually. The other course uh, where we talk about this in more detail uh, on this double pendulum. So there are a bunch of there are a few animations. Um, let's see. There is actually a derivation of the equations of motion of a double pendulum. So what you have is you have a pendulum, right? Nonlinear pendulum, and then attached to it another nonlinear pendulum. So um, so this one is, you know, obviously it has how many degrees of freedom? Okay, maybe. So what I'm referring to, how many uh, variables do you have to to um, state to, I mean, to identify to determine the state of the system? Four, Four right? You need this position and the uh, angular momentum. Uh, aren't they called? Uh, so th to me, that's. Hmm? I thought you meant literally the degrees theta when theta t. Right. So how many? I mean, do you call those degrees of freedom? I don't know. Maybe maybe in other fields you don't. But uh, so I'd say it has four degrees of freedom. So it has you have four different uh, four state variables, right? Uh, and these are the equations. Okay. Um, now what I'm saying nonlinear pendulum. I'm not saying that the pendulum is like uh, bent, right? <laughs> I'm just saying that the, the motion is occurring not just near the equilibrium, right? So it. it it actually can be as you know, as well as going around the clock uh, for each of the pendulum, right? Uh, so for one single pendulum, you saw the non the nonlinear equation was what well, was theta double prime. That was the angle. Newton's law, right? It was you had on the right hand side something with sine of theta, right? That made it nonlinear. And of course, if theta was small, sine of theta was approximately theta, so it made it linear. But so here you, you see a bunch of sines, cosines, uh, cosine square of the differences, right? And also it involves the uh, first derivative, and this I believe ignores friction. 
So even in the absence of friction, you have terms with a momentum square. With a momentum, right? With a velocity square. Okay. Um, well, okay, so this, this is not actually working. But I want to show you those, those two equations. Um, and you probably have seen this. Um, well, you, you may have seen it actually even in reality. Come on. Um, but you can, if you follow, and by the way, this is not plotting in the, in the phase space, right? It's not a four-dimensional plot. It's only a plot of the theta 1 versus theta 2, but not even theta 1 versus theta 2 is, is how the actual uh, configuration of the pendulum looks like, right? But if, if you were to plot theta 1 versus theta 2, then it would still look like a messy, right? Unpredict unpredictable uh, motion, right? Deterministic, but, right? There's no, there's no random factors that is causing like this this uh, rotation or that you know that turn or that right so this is deterministic but um, unpredictable or sensitive to initial condition of course if you are to move it right just a little bit things are gonna oops I think I don't know that's I'm not supposed to force it but this just seems to wow okay now it has its mind of its own so um, there was another animation which I found but again this this you can oh yeah so this is actually the plot uh, the, uh, the angle one versus angle two but it's not again it's not the face face space plot right because face space is four dimensional right so this picture is is what is a projection of of a four dimensional curve, right, in the two dimensions. Now this doesn't actually look chaotic, right? Why not? Because the initial conditions were very close to the equilibria, so this is not. But the moment you change that, and I guess you clear the graph. Um, the moment you're kind of moving in the nonlinear regime, right? Well, well, try it. I mean, there's movies. That, I mean, the physics people like this a lot. Um, they make they make it. And then, then you can see that. But again, keep in mind what chaotic means. And of course, unpredictability is one thing, right? So in other words, you, you never kind of know how many, I don't know, revolution the, e, e, either will do um, at any time, right? But also, the more important thing is that you change the initial condition by a little bit, and it's going to do something totally different. OK? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think there is, you know, there's, there's only a limited amount of mathematical theory that you can actually apply to predict the ranges of initial conditions where things will do things and things won't do it. So, like, like this one, right? I mean, there are certain regions in the, in the phase space which is um, four-dimensional, right? There are some pockets where there's no chaotic behavior, right? But the, the point is that there is, so I don't know the, those, what those pockets are. I mean, um, it's four dimensional. But On this particular example, it seemed to be stable for a little while. Exactly. So that's. It's lost. No, it's completely and, and And by the way, you can actually do this again with your, uh, you know, granted you have the time, you can actually um, um, convince yourself that. that you know, this is not, not like artifact. I mean, this is not just a fake, right? This is simply kind of plotting 
the, the solutions of those of those teras uh, of those of those um, uh, values of the tera and the, the velocities, right, at all times. Now, are those are those equations? Always uh, matching the experiments? No, because in experiments you have friction, you have even more complicated things, right? So, in experiments, things eventually were going to settle down, right? Because your energy is lost through friction. But here, here is, you know, except that thing, this is actually uh, as close to reality as, as, you, can, as you can tell. Um, Okay, so the last thing was to actually um, show you that if you import this, well, export, import, um, in OD solve, so I wrote that code, um, yeah, well, anybody can write it based on those equations, okay, but. Um, and you can go to OD solve and load the system. Okay. Now it's it's a mess, right? But but it's it's explicit, right? You can write it down. Um, so so this is, and then you can you can plot this. And again. Uh, the point is to plot. You see, in this case, it would really have to be x1 and x2. You can try other things, of course, but okay. And this is what comes out um, for this initial conditions, which are not the most probably. Uh, so you have to. I think that's what you referred to. That we we actually try this with various uh, initial conditions. And I think if we choose y1 and y2 equal to zero, this means the initial velocity is zero. So you always just place the initial configuration at rest at some point. But uh, if you change those, you can see this. Yeah. When you're working with something like this, is that those equations are so complex, and you know if you mistype a, a sign or yeah. a variable, something like that, is there a, a technique for finding your mistake, or is it just um, it's like you're asking if you when you type on a on a URL in a in a browser and it's wrong, um, is there something that tells you you're wrong? No. I mean, I'm amazed how many times I, I mistype Google and sometimes it just you know Google says it's not you know. So. I don't know. I mean, um, so looks like typing is something that still yeah. relies on us. Yeah. Um, of course, if if you see a behavior that's totally different than what you expect, well, which this is, but for uh, for you know, domestic for domesticated models where you know what you should expect, then that's a way of checking. But um, okay, any questions on this? So it's so this this is a, this is chaotic behavior of course in four dimensions but if there wasn't three dimensions I mean now it's like no 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 surprise this is happening in more dimensions right still I think this is much more tangible than the Lorentz model right even though that was three dimensional this is this is a pendulum you can actually manufacture and 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 see okay. Um, so, where is my? Uh, okay. So, no, no. Okay. So, uh, so anyway, so that's that was kind of what I wanted to go through. Um, so similarly, e plus e minus turn out to be. Stable, but the main point, the main point is the phase space analysis is key uh, to long time behavior. 
in nonlinear systems. Okay. Uh, three or more dimension. Especially. Okay. I mean, even in two dimensions, even in two dimensions, um, just looking at the, at the steady states, limit cycles, um, it's, it, you, you cannot actually conclude what happens with every every solution, uh, long-term behavior. But uh, it's much, it's much. Um, well, the possibilities are, are much more restricted than in three dimensions or more. Okay, so um, so again, this is pretty much what what we can do um, at this point. Um, if you if you really want to dive into the like why this, I mean, how can you explain this in kind of in a deeper at a deeper level? Um, I suggest, as I said this uh, last time, I gave you. Uh, that chapter from from this book, and you can just see for the um, uh, logistic equation how um, I forgot it was in, in chapter three uh, logistic equation where you can actually write things explicitly even when you have chaotic behavior you can write the iteration explicitly um, to see why there is that kind of behavior or how can you explain this but it involves you know somewhat more complicated uh, co concepts from you know an analysis so it's a little bit beyond this uh, this class and by the way there is a there's a little section in the same chapter 3 in this book following that discussion of chaotic behavior that um, talks about kind of an experimental setup where this chaotic behavior was observed in in in, in I think a bacteria population or in some some sort of uh, uh, population model. So it's not just that we discretize a continuous model for our convenience or for our numerical integration purposes and we observe this thing and it's wow, right? So, so it actually happens in, in um, you know, in, in, uh, in biological, um, pop in, in uh, population dynamics too. So anyway, kind of interesting, and then it has uh, pointers to more, um, you know, more in-depth um, studies of this. Okay, so let's see. Um, I'm kind of ready to, unless you want to talk a little bit more about this, I'm ready to go to, to Chapter 7, uh, start talking about probability. How many of you had... Probability course. I mean, okay. Well, you're supposed to have one. So, um, okay. Um, so we're not going to be using a lot of like a lot of hard uh, concepts, uh, probabilistic concepts. But um, <coughs> models and so again most of you know things that we're going to be talking is uh, is going to be self-contained but um, you should try to make connections with what you've seen before and <clears throat> again what am I uh, why are we adding this you know uh, aspect to the uh, to a modeling course well simply because um, many many times when we make simplifying assumptions, we ignore random, uh, you know, random changes or random uh, 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 external effects on on our model. So um, and so we we until now we everything was deterministic, right? We said it's we know how the rate of change of a certain quantity uh, is. Uh, depending on you know current state, previous state, whatever, right? It was it was uh, very 
um, well, it was sort of very explicit, right? So, so let's see. So, in this chapter, we're going to talk about two types. One is discrete probability models, and continuous probability model. Now, the word discrete and continuous actually has a different meaning than, well, somewhat different meaning than until now. Until now, we talked about discrete in time or continuous in time, right? So if the, if the variables depend or change continuously or not with respect to the, the time, okay? So, so let's see what does it mean in this context, discrete. So we started discrete probability models. Um, well, clearly the, I mean, that experiment that, of, of throwing die, dice um, is um, on, on everybody's mind when we talk about discrete probability models. So, so let's, let's just think about this experiment of throwing two dice. And and uh, record the um, outcome. Okay, so possible outcomes are um, as follows. You could have. Numbers one one, numbers one two, numbers up to six six appearing on top, right? So, so this forms a set, right? Which, you know, from now on we're going to talk the sample space. Whoops, you're supposed to look upside down now. Uh, the sample space. Okay, and it simply consists of, I mean, literally of this of these values, right? So you can think of them as some discrete set. Okay, so it's a discrete set of possible outcomes. So can you say that those three sample space consists of a finite number of possible outcomes and discrete probability models? And if so, then sure. Well, even even if it's not finite, even if it's infinite. Uh, it could it could still be discrete, right? Uh, the point is that it um, right, but it, so the question is, you know, what would be a, a continuous probability modeling? You would have to have the sample space to be continuous, right? In some sense, whether it's space or it's you know other things, but it should be kind of uh, you should be able to move in that space continuously, right? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking that it could also be uncountable, or no? I mean, yeah, probably not. Probably you want, yeah, you want to stay countable. Hmm? Uncountable? Yeah, of course you can have infinite countable, but can you have an infinite uncountable set and still be discrete? I don't know. Well, there are other, other types of uncountable sets, but anyway, it's a good it's a good thing to to imagine that I can count these numbers, right? And I can list them. Countable set means you can list them, even if it's infinite, you can list it. Find a, a listing of that. So, um, so yeah. So, what happened here? Oh, it's coming up. Uh, let me <clears throat> let me save this before it's. Okay. Okay. So. Um, okay. So. Just just a little bit of terminology. So I wanna I wanna kind of write this down. So we, um, again, with your with your experience, prior experience, and um, we can t we can speak the same language. Uh, so a set. So an event. 
A is just simply a subset of the sample space. Okay? So, again, thinking of it as a finite or discrete sample space, you know, if I only take a subset of this and I call this A, then this is actually called, that I'm, I'm, I'm calling this an event, right? And I can give it a name. Um, and, of course, how many subsets, I mean, what kind of subsets can he have? Well, he can have the empty set. This would be the impossible event. Um, at the other extreme, you could have the whole set, right? This would be certain event. Okay? So, what would be, what is a uh, probability of an event? So once you kind of, say, choose your favorite subset of this sample space, you can assign a probability to, to this event, okay? So, so if every um, outcome in S has equal probability of occurring, Uh, then the probability of uh, an event A is simply given by a count, right? So it's some, some we write P of A to be, and that's the number of uh, outcomes in A divided by the number of uh, possible outcomes. So, if it is a finite set, it could it would simply be the ratio of the the size, right? The size of the of the of the subset A divided by the size of the whole set. But again, if if the set is infinite, then you don't have that, right? And again, it's important that this. Um, that this count, you know, that, that, that each outcome in, in this set has the same probability, or it's equally likely, right? So this is a determination you have to make uh, prior to, to talking about probability of an event. You have to talk about probability of, a, of an outcome, okay, from occurring. So, um, all right, so, so those you probably know. Um, so, for example, uh, what's the probability that the sum of the two dies? What's the plural? Is it die? Uh, the two die um, is is it dies? Okay, thank you. Uh, is like eight, right? So. When you say what's the probability that that some event is occurring, it actually means count the the outcomes in that event or the favorable favorable event, uh, outcomes, right? So these are these are all the possibilities now. I think there's one, one issue here is like, do we count 2 and 6, and 6 and 2 as two different outcomes? Uh, and the answer is, well, I think it should be, right? Because the two dies are, have their own independent, they're not uh, attached to each other. So, so you could, one could be red, one could be blue. So, so if the red comes 2 and the blue comes 6, that's a different event than if the red comes six and the blue comes two, something like that, right? So, so in, in that sense, I have the probability of this event is going to be five over the total possible uh, total possibility, which is thirty-six. By the way, should we count four and four as two different ones? No, right? So, 
so you don't uh, because that's just you know just just one one outcome, right? So all of these are are equally prob I mean equally likely to occur, right? Each die is um, is um, you know fair something like that. Okay, so. Okay, so the next thing, which is kind of the most important... Yes, please. Aren't there two separate ways that four and four can happen, though? Could you go into that as a little bit? You can have red, four, and blue, four. I don't know. I mean, uh, look, these are, these are questions that you have to ask, yeah. Um, but... How, how, how come there are two different ways? <laughs> yeah. So, again. Uh, it depends on whether or, not whether or not order matters. Yeah. If order matters, then you have to count it. If order doesn't matter, then... What order? I'm just throwing two dice. Yeah. Whether you can... <laughs> <laughs> if, if you have a blue or a red die, it's <laughs> If you have a blue or red die and order matters and you always count blue first, then you're going to have two fours or two two different combinations of four because order matters because blue is always first. Yeah. No, look, uh, I'm not a probabilist, okay? Um, so all I'm, I mean, all, all I'm thinking is, is just what I think is true. But um, I think it can be, you know, formalized to the answer is... is you know that's just one one event equally likely from the other ones okay but um, let, let's just I, I just want to introduce one more thing before we, we leave and that is random variables uh, to me the the concept of random variables well of course this is kind of the key in all probability right and uh, uh, with enough kind of exposure to it is is no longer anything mysterious shouldn't be anything mysterious right um, because it simply is a function so when I say that x is a random variable all I, all we mean is that x is called a random variable if uh, x uh, is is simply a function with some properties, with some uh, additional properties, which I'm not listing here. I mean, um, um, I mean, it has to be measurable. So, um, but but again, if S is like a finite or discrete set. All of that is kind of is thrown out of the window. It's just a simply a function. So you make an assignment, and by the way, this is this is a real valued random variable, right? So you assign to every outcome a real number, right? And think about s as being uh, discrete. So s s is finite or countable or whatever discrete means, right? This is is a think about it as a, a discrete. Okay, so for example, um, here are a few examples. So, sum of two dice that is a random, a random variable. So, if I'm calling the two dice, the red and the blue, whatever, right? So, the red and the blue. Each goes between one and six. And by the way, we, we oftentimes will will use omega maybe, or you know that's customary uh, to use omega as a possible outcome. Uh, so x of omega or x of R B, which is as a sum of the two, that is a random variable. Okay. Yeah, it's just a function. Okay, so uh, so x 
can take um, different values anywhere between two and twelve for this one, right? This is for this example, right? Uh, each with different probability. So when you know in the simplest cases in this simple example um, the question of what values can the random variable take uh, says is it possible for instance that the random variable takes a value 8 well if that's happening that's an event right so we're looking this is actually an event so the event that x is 8 is simply saying collect the outcomes in that sample space for which the value of the random variable is 8. Right? So this is a subset, it's an event, right? And what's the probability of this event? Oftentimes we just ignore the accolades. So it's, it's just say, what's the probability that this event occurs? Well, it's just counting things. And we said, right, it's 5 over 36. Okay? So in that sense, we say that uh, the, the random variable can take different values with, with, uh, with, cert with each, each with a certain probability. Okay? So if you do... Um, so similarly, can the pro can the um, for instance can the well what's the probability that the random variable takes a value one? Well, what's the probability of the of the null event or of the impossible event? And by that count, just by the count, it says zero, right? There's no favorable outcome. Um, so what you what do we do here? We actually write well. It's it's a kind of a mute point to uh, to do this for every single value. But you can see that the value two uh, there's going to be some probability, right? So the event you know is when when both are one and one, and again that's one occurrence, uh, one over thirty six. And so forth, right? Probability that x is 3 is now 2 over 36. Because you can have 1, 2, and 2, 1. Yeah. So, Yeah. Right. So, I mean, um, I mean, how do the random variables show up? Well, you have to make an observable. So it's whatever you observe be beyond just the outcomes. So based on the outcomes, you have to make a, a measurement, right? In this case, it would be the sum of those two things. But whatever measurement you make, you assign a value to that outcome, right? And that's like a one uh, run of that experiment. Yeah. So it's and it's 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 again. Um, yeah. So that's I think that's kind of um, well. It's part of the modeling process. You have to determine what you need to. What are you observing? What are you uh, besides just the experiment, right? But uh, but yeah, it's kind of early on in the in the process, certainly. Um, so what I'm doing here is simply I'm saying um, that. I'm looking at all possible values. In fact, it doesn't even have to be like 1, 2, 3. It could be 2.5, right? You could say, what's the probability that x takes that value? Obviously, 0, right? So in this case, there's going to be just a few, um, a discrete number of, of possible outcomes. So you're going to have discrete values for x, and those values are well, 2 to 12. And with this probability, so, um, so, this computation is simply uh, building kind of the probability distribution, if you want, 
of that uh, random variable and it's typically it's just kind of writing it on uh, uh, displaying it as a histogram so histogram is basically saying how many um, possible well um, so let me put it probability distribution either way you want to look at it um, it basically says the values to be between 2 and 12 are the possible values with what probability well uh, this is probability 1 over 36 uh, the next one is 2 over 36 right um, and so forth I think you're gonna have the maximum well you have to f figure out basically what the maximum probability is gonna be I think when, when uh, when you only have seven, that's six over thirty-six. So seven is kind of in the middle, right? The eight, which we computed, was five over thirty-six, and then it come, comes back down to one over thirty-six, right? Okay, so so it's obviously it's not uh, a well, it's not any any sort of curve like this, but. Uh, but you have this distribution of uh, this uh, probability distribution of this random variable, right? So this is sort of what we like to do uh, with any random variable that we were given, right? So the distribution of x is given by these numbers, which are the probability that x takes value k and k goes between 2 and well you could actually start with 1 right the only thing is when x is when k is 1 that's 0 right okay so um, so there are other things but we're, we're out of time um, so we're going to continue this on Wednesday um, if you are really bored because you've had this um, I would say, you know, you can look at this, uh, the chapter in the book. Um, there's not much. I mean, so we're, we're very quickly go to continuous models, uh, talk about the density function and all this. Um, um, and I don't know. I mean, again, you shouldn't be bored because you have to do on the, the other homework, which is... Um, okay, but use this as a kind of a review if you want. Okay? Thank you.